Before we end, I just want to quote Francis Chan by having you do something. Can you just take a deep breath, just a big, deep breath? The only reason you were able to do that is because God let you. And one of the things that I oftentimes take for granted in prayer is thanksgiving. And we think thanksgiving is just something, something formal we have to do to start prayer. And all over the room, I want you to ponder just for a moment what the Lord has done in your life this last week that you can actually thank Him for. Can you ponder that for a moment? Are we good here? Check, check. Are we good? Am I good? Can you ponder that for a moment? As you ponder, I just want you to begin to open your mouth out loud. How many of you were like me as a kid? You went to, you were, you were a, how many of you are football fans in here? Anybody like football? How many of you screamed on Saturdays for your football team? Anybody? And then you went to church and you were quiet and you were awkward and you put your hands in your pocket and you were pondering why that was. I always was shocked that I would scream on Saturdays but be quiet on Sundays. And so as we ponder what the Lord has done in our lives, can we open our mouths and thank Him? Lord, we thank You all over this room that You have established Your covenant with us, Your steadfast mercy, Your steadfast love. Like Abraham, You have called us to walk before You in mercy, in love, in justice. Lord, we thank you that you call us to walk before you like Abraham. That you call us time and time again to meet with you. Not to do rules in a book, but to meet with the living God. Lord, we bless your name tonight. And we honor you and we don't take tonight for granted as you meet with us in this room, in Jesus' name. Amen, thank you guys. You guys can have your seats. If you would, uh, people on the side here, can you not sit on the wall and would everybody in this room find a seat? That would be amazing. Sorry, Liam, I was holding the mic wrong. Forgive me. <laughs> Guys, we're so grateful that you're here tonight. We have a few announcements as, uh, as we get in, but I just want to honor a couple people in the room tonight. How many of you love Upper Room? That was tame. That was tame. I'm going to be honest with you. How many of you listen to Upper Room on a weekly basis? Okay. Well, we have Peter Lewis and some of his crew here from Upper Room teaching on our DTS this week. And we just wanted to honor them. Can we give them a round of applause for being here tonight? How many of you are part of CRX in this room in here? Can you raise your hand? I heard, I heard that he detonated the room this morning. Is this, is this facts? Peter, we honor you, bro. Thank you for being here with us this week. Got a few more announcements for you guys. Can we get those on the screen up here? What's the first one? Guys, I say it all the time. If you've heard me host before, you need to get trained you can't be a Christian who runs around with his or her head cut off like a chicken and just mindlessly going about. You need to get trained on how to share the gospel, on how to reach your friends, on how to do all sorts of things in the Christian life. And so if you would like to be trained online, if you're in school, in high school, and you get bored in English class, and you'd rather watch a video on how to preach the gospel, then you should sign up for Carry the Love Accelerator. You did not hear me. Don't quote me on that. I didn't tell you to do that. Um, but sign up for Carry the Love Accelerator. You can go to crtv.com and you can sign up through there. Or you can take out your phone right now and also scan this QR code. And I think it's such a privilege and an honor that you guys live in a generation where you can use media to be trained and follow Jesus radically in your generation. So don't take this lightly. It's super awesome. It's amazing training. Sign up for Carry the Love Accelerator. Next slide. Okay, how many of you are vibey and you like media and you like photography and all sorts of things? Raise your hands. Come on, that's, that's weak. That was weak. 
How many of you like photography, videography? Also, okay, awesome. If you are talented in this room, I'm not talented. My wife's talented. She does all sorts of things to me. If you ever see anything on social media, it's because of my wife. She's talented. I'm not. And so we, how many of you have ever been impacted by Circuit Rider Media? Guys, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Peter, upper room. We have the best media in the Christian world. I just, I'm biased. I am just so biased. And we're offering a media internship this next year, June, I mean January 2023. If you are a photographer, if you are a videographer, and you want to partake in Circuit Rider Media, and you want to be a part of some of the campaigns we run, like The Send, like Carry the Love, like Black Voices, and we strongly encourage you as well to sign up. Come get trained, be a part of our media internship. It's going to be amazing this year. It's going to be January 2023. There's the QR code. You can sign up online as well. Last slide. What's the last one? Greenhouse. How many of you come to Greenhouse? I barely, I barely even need to say this. But once again, we want to host the presence of Jesus Christ in Huntington Beach, in Costa Mesa, in Southern California. And so join us for Greenhouse Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. The times are up there. You can find it on our social media as well. Okay. Are you guys ready for the message tonight? Is Jay Stamper up here? Come here, bro. Come here. Now. Jonathan Stamper is bringing the word tonight. As a preacher, one of the most important things is to be vulnerable. One time we had Francis Chan come and speak at one of our training schools in the summer at 21 Project. And he literally talked about the fear of the Lord through his life and how he wasn't fearing God. And at the end of it, he ripped his shirt in front of 300 people. Just completely ripped it off in front of us. And I don't know. After that, for me, I was personally like, I'm never going to be a tame preacher that puts the mask on and tries to get people to like me. And so tonight, vulnerability is key. Jonathan's bringing the word on shame, I believe, tonight. Here we go, bro. What's going on, guys? It's good to see everybody. I appreciate the encouragement through claps and cheers. And what that lets me know is you have no problem making noise. So this is what I need you to do. Everybody stand up on your feet. Those who have heard me preach before, you know where we're going. But we've got to open up this atmosphere because God's got a lot of work to do. The worship team did such an amazing job, but I feel like engaging our hearts on the next level is going to contribute to the breakthrough. So if you could, could you isolate a neighbor for me on either side, um, find you one. As soon as you have one, just let me know that you've got one. I want to hear unity in the room. And I need you to make this declaration, okay? This is going to be very important, especially tonight. And the rule goes, I will know how much you believe it by how loud you shout. Listen, I'm Baptist, Pentecostal, and everything else. So I, I like participation. Does that sound good? It's more than just for me. It's for the spirit realm. We make announcements and declarations that open up veins in the spirit. So this is what we're about to do. You ready? You have it? Okay, repeat after me. Say neighbor. One more time with a little bit more oomph, okay? Say, neighbor. Neighbor. Today is the day. Today is the day. Where everything changes. changes. Now lift up a shout of worship all across this room. Come on. I said lift up a shout. I said lift up a shout. We didn't come here to play church games. We came to meet with God. We need transformation. So right now, lift up your voice all across this room. Come on, the King of Glory is in the building. And he came to do some work. Amen. You guys can have your seats. Feels good. I feel good now. Okay. This, I believe, tonight will be one of the most important sermons I've ever preached in my life. And um, it's gonna, we're going to take a lot of twists and turns. Um, and there's one particular part of this that makes this unique that I thought I was going to save toward the end. But the Holy Spirit said to me very clearly that we were to start with it in order to set the table, okay? Um, and so I want to give you guys my formal intro and then we're going to get into it, okay? 
How many of you consider yourselves gamers in the room? You like games. You don't have to be into video games. Some of you guys like video games. I myself am not an aficionado at stuff like 2K. I tell my friends when they play basketball with me on the whatever it is, the PS4 or PS7, um, I tell them that I'm the practice round. Um, I'm, the, I'm the round that you use to build your confidence because you're guaranteed to win. But... Um, there are other games that I, I fancy myself in. For example, um, I promise you that 99% of you in the room cannot see me in Uno. I guarantee you. <laughs> now, there are some people in here who have beat me. Um, it's off the record. We don't have to mention it. And I tip my hat to you. But I consider myself pretty good at that game. The point of it is we all have games we like to play. Some people like to play games on their phone. You know that basketball game where you be, um, yeah, I don't know how, what it's called. Don't, don't mind me. But um, we all like games, right? I feel like tonight there's a game that not that we need to play, but that we've already been playing. But I want to isolate for a little bit to engage you in an understanding of the story you've been in for a really, really long time. Is that Okay. This game is a really, really important one, and it's one that basically creates a development around every facet of your entire life. And the name of this game is called The Shame Game. If you're taking notes, can you write this down? I said The Shame Game. One more time, The Shame Game. We are getting into it, so we're just going to pull the trigger immediately, okay? And... Uh, we're going for it. You see me delaying, so I don't have to say what I feel like I'm supposed to say. Um, shame is probably something that I am most familiar with in my entire life. There's a few things I'm familiar with. Um, as you've known by my worship leader, I'm familiar with raising my voice. I'm also familiar with losing it. Um, but one of the things that I'm most familiar with in my life is shame. And part of that is because of a lot of the experiences that I've had in my life. And a lot of them have been extremely formative. I've experienced, my family's experienced divorce. We've experienced all different kinds of things. But one of the areas of pain and shame that I've experienced the most is actually in the area of sexual brokenness. We're going for it already, okay? Because there's no time to play games in church, okay? I've experienced all different types of stuff. Um, just for the record for everybody, because we're just going to go for it, because if I can be vulnerable, then you guys can be vulnerable, right? I've experienced every kind of abuse that you can imagine, every category, yes, every category. You understand what I'm saying, especially when we're talking about sexual trauma. I've experienced specific things that have formed and fashioned my life at ages that were very, very inappropriate. You can imagine. I hope you don't have to imagine in the room, but I want you to get into the picture of this in your heart so that you can understand the framework that I'm coming from. When I was a little boy, I had certain experiences that taught me some really off things about love. Um, one particular experience that I will not detail, but the only thing that I want to say about it is that specific acts and behaviors I was introduced to in the context of love. I was taught, if you love people, you do this. If you love people, you do that. And it introduced me to a world that I knew nothing of, but, but kind of broke certain systems in my life. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Now, that was my formal introduction into the shame game. Because... Oftentimes when we talk about shame, we consider it only in things we've done wrong. But shame introduces itself in many ways, and we'll get into it. But we've all found our own introduction into the shame game. Mine may be a little more dramatic than you have expected. But every single one of us have had our own entrance into the shame game. And I'll detail a little bit more of my story and why it's significant for your breakthrough tonight in a little bit. But I wanted us to start this thing out on a context of vulnerability. Is that okay? Shame is one of the most powerful cultures in the entire world. The reason why I know this, if you're taking notes, is the first time shame is mentioned is in Genesis 2, I believe. Um, and I want to talk about this really quickly because this is one of my favorite things I've ever seen in Scripture. Um, it's really powerful to consider the idea that shame is so powerful that the way that Jesus wanted to articulate the pre-fall world, the Eden world, the kingdom of God fully um, alive and thriving was through this, this, the descriptive word unashamed. The ending of Genesis 2 describes the relationship between Adam and Eve, and it says this. After they joined in union, found each other, got married, um, and began the process of being fruitful and multiplying, it says they were naked and what? Unashamed. 
How powerful of a culture does shame create in society that in order to articulate the perfection of a world without sin, that the thing that would be used to describe it would not be a world without sin, but a world without shame. The idea that shame is so normative to our culture that for you to crave the kingdom of God, the way that God would want to express it is it's a world without shame. What that leads me to is a set of questions that I'm sure we've all asked ourselves in so many ways, but I want to ask formally, what would life be like if we had no shame? What would your life be like? How would it change if shame was completely absent from your story in every way? How would it change your relationships? How would it change your vocation? How would it change your work ethic? How would it change your view of yourself? How would it change your view of God? There's so much around this. But in order to unpack this, we've got to give some definition and go into detail. Can everybody say detail? I want to give you some understanding around shame because it's a buzzword, but I think some clarity will help us in this conversation. Sounds good? Now, there is a core belief surrounding shame, and I wrote it down for you, so if you want to take notes, you can. This will be one of the areas where it will be appropriate to do so. Um, But the core belief surrounding shame that I could articulate in my own human frailty is that there is something inside of us that makes us inherently unworthy. This is really, really important. Shame tells us the narrative that there's something inside of us that is un- inherently unworthy, unworthy of love, unworthy of approval, unworthy of acceptance, unworthy of affection, et cetera, et cetera. And now the next question would be how is shame produced? There are many ways that shame can be produced, but I want to dive into a few tonight. Is this okay? Now, there was um, an excerpt that the Lord had me write a while back um, around the idea of being known by God. And one of the pieces of it was this idea called the recipe for intimacy. And this idea is built around the presupposition that there are four primary things that every human heart needs in order to feel fully free and fully alive. Are you ready for them? If they're inaccurate, you can talk to me about it after. But I think many of us may relate to these. Okay. So these are the four. The first one is to be known. To be understood is the second, to be accepted is the third, and to be wanted is the fourth. Now, you probably have not separated all four of these um, much in your life, but I want to dive into the differences between these, okay? And I'll do it this way. I want to use your life experience and your relationships as an example. Is that okay? So we're going to break it up two by two. So these four are differentiated as follows. You can know someone and not understand them. All of us have had relationships like this before. You have information about somebody. You have kind of a cognitive basis of their their, their life, information, their height, their their date of birth, their city. But you you just don't get them. Things don't compute. Things don't kind of break down in your heart of how they're operating or why they're operating the way that they do. Likewise, you can know a person and understand them but not accept them. Much of us, in our understanding, the next step is the rejection of people. We decide, based on our understanding, that you are not someone we want in our lives. You are not someone who shares our values. Does this make sense? You're seeing what the differences are. Um, But likewise, and this is where it really gets interesting. You can know someone, understand them, even accept them, but not want them. All of us know relationships like this in our lives that are built on the premise of obligation. Anybody going to be real with me? Where you know that you're accepted, but it's on the premise of obligation that they accept you because they have to and not because they want to. I'll give you an example that has nothing to do with people. Anybody in the room know what it's like to have a bill, any kind of bill. It can be a cable bill. It can be a telephone bill. What they say, what what Beyonce and them say, telephone bill, automobile. Um, Y'all know what I'm talking about. Now, we accept them. If you don't, um, IRS is going to find you or somebody. You have to accept the fact that you have bills. But I can probably assume that most of us don't want them. So they exist in our lives and we relate to them in a healthy way. But there's an understanding between us that you are not something that I desire in my world. We going to play or we going to go for it? How many of us know what it's like to be in a relationship where we know that we're known, we're understood, we're even accepted, but we're not desired? I relate to you because I have to. I'm on this team with you because I have to. 
I take you to school because I have to. I'm your mother. I'm your father, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, I, got, I was vulnerable. Okay, I told y'all all my stuff. So we can go for it tonight, amen? Okay. Now, shame shows up in those last three pretty often in different ways. You can feel the shame of not being understood when you're in a place and you're trying to express yourself fully and you feel like there's a cognitive dissonance and people don't really get you for who you truly are. Shame tries to show up. It can show up in the way where you feel rejected. You, you took the bravery of being your full self in an environment and people decided that that person or that behavior was not acceptable for here. Shame can enter there. And shame can sure enough enter where you feel like you are unaccepted but unwanted, where you're not desired. That's a shame that's harder to articulate oftentimes, but we've experienced each and every one of them. And I will also go as far to say is that many of us relate to God on one of these four premises. It can explain much of your relationship with him. Many of you don't believe that he knows you. You don't believe he has the full understanding, but most of us do. We understand that he's all-knowing, he has all this information, but we don't believe that he can understand because he's God and he doesn't know what it's like to be in this body except that the Bible says that we have not a high priest who's not touched with the feelings of our infirmity. So that deals with number two. He understands, but he could not possibly accept me. If he knew everything about me and if he knew everything that I had done, he could not possibly accept this person. But the blood speaks something very very, very differently. The blood says that he accepts me. He welcomes me into his arms. But the problem that most of us have is not with the fact that he knows us. It's not with the fact that he even understands us. And it's not the fact that he accepts us. It's the belief that he does. We gonna go for it? It's the belief that he desires us. I believe that God likes me because Jesus made him. Woo! Oh, we're going for it. The blood was so strong that God has to accept me even though he don't want to. You got to let me in. It don't mean I can sit close though. I can be in the room, but I better not mess up nothing. Because then my acceptance will be revoked. All right, here, we're just going to keep going, okay? I don't have a lot of time. Shame can show up in so many different ways, and it's often associated with sin in our Christian context. But how many know that most of our shame does not only come around the things that we've done that are sinful? You can experience shame for things that are good. I'll explain. This is very good. You can, uh, we'll, we'll get to the good one in a second. Okay. Shame can enter through personal mistakes or the failure to live up to someone's expectations. You might not have done anything sinful, but you just didn't live up to whatever somebody wanted you to be. And you can feel that chasm and you're like, man, I feel ashamed. I don't know how to describe this feeling, but the description is the feeling of shame. The next one is shame can enter through good things that are not culturally or socially accepted. Why do you think that Paul would have to say, I am not ashamed? of the gospel which means that you can be ashamed of things that are good you can be ashamed of things that are true you can be ashamed of things that are helpful but because it's an inconvenience to other people you feel the chasm of relationship and shame is produced does that make sense so a lot of shame doesn't begin with sin but it produces sin if we don't respond to it correctly and then as my story outlined shame can also enter not through things you did but things that were done to you that changed the way that you see yourself. And we'll dive into my story a little bit more to help you. But we all know what this feels like. You feel, when you feel shame, you feel exposed. You feel unsettled. You feel unsafe. How many know what I'm talking about? Does this make sense? And the result is as follows. This is what I call the psychology of shame. So if you want, you're taking notes, I want you to look at this. I'm going to dive into a scripture that has the word shame in it, but it's not often talked about in shame conversations. It's actually Philippians 3, verses 18 through 19, and it's as follows. Paul is describing to the Philippian church a group of people who he describes as enemies of the cross of Christ. And these are the descriptions he uses in verse 19. Whose end is destruction. This is about the world whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Wow. Now we're going to have some fun. How many people have ever heard someone say when someone does something reckless, when someone does something, dare I say, dumb, when somebody does something that's sinful or puts their life in a position of havoc, we say this phrase, have you no shame? We think that reckless behavior proves the absence of shame. But if this scripture is correct, then shame motivates all sinful behavior. Shame motivates most reckless behavior. 
because shame is present. In fact, it's their glory. Shame is the glory of the world, which is why they know stuff is wrong, but they gloat in it. That's why they celebrate the things that get, create disorientation inside of their inner man. They don't know what to do with it because they can't get free from it. So they create a psychology where they celebrate things that disturb them from the inside out. Whose glory is in. It's not that they don't have shame. They place it in a place where they celebrate it because they don't know what to do with it. Does that make sense? Now, when I dive into the word glory, this is where it gets fun because we're talking about the psychology of shame. One thing you don't understand about the glory until you study Greek and Hebrew and things like that is that there are two words for glory. First one is kabod or kabod, which means the weighty presence. But the second one is a Greek word called doxa. And that word can translate to something called perspective or point of view, which means that when the glory of God enters into a room, it's not just his power, it's his point of view. It's not just his perspective. It's his idea of the way he sees life, which is why when sickness enters the glory, that's what it means when we say on earth as it is in heaven, we're aligning with God's point of view. In his point of view, everything's finished. Does that make sense? But if that's true, then that means that the glory being shame means that the perspective and the view of the world is built around their shame. Whose glory, which means their view. The way they see the world, the way they see life, the way they see every relationship and every important thing in their space is through shame. Shame trains the brain. Can you say that? Shame trains the brain. It's literally psychological. You can do research. How many of y'all heard of Brené Brown? Brené Brown is a real fun lady. She has a, a TED Talk. I don't know that much about her, but she has a TED Talk about, um, about shame. And it was very convicting. I watched it a few times, even in pre preparation for this message. But what the, the main thing that I learned from watching her and watching others is the power of the psychology of shame. And that shame actually has neurological effects on your life, on your behaviors. It's literally changes the way you see the world. Does this make sense? And these are some ways that I'm going to use scripture to dive into some of these. But I want y'all to go with me. Again, I'm Pentecostal. So if y'all talk me down, it'll make me feel like I'm anointed, okay? So this is what we're going to do. Okay? These are some of the things that shame does in your life. Are you ready? We're all, it's surgery for all of us. So if we laugh at it, we'll have a good time, okay? The first thing that shame does is that shame makes you afraid. This is the truth. Most of the things you're afraid of in life are not because you're afraid of the things. You're afraid of the shame that the things will bring. You're not afraid to sing. You're afraid that if you crack on the microphone, everybody going to laugh and you're going to feel what? You be singing in your shower all the time. That's how I know you ain't scared. But you're scared of the feeling that comes up when people don't accept what you have. First one. Here we go. Here's the next one. Shame creates distance. So it makes you distant. And the way that shows up is having shallow and guarded relationships. Most of us think we're antisocial. I'm coming down your road, but we're going to have some fun. You think you're antisocial. You think you're introverted. But you actually live in a life governed by shame. I know it because I was in it. I don't want nobody to get too close to me because if they see me act in a way that ain't cool. It's the reason why most people who say they're antisocial just become a whole ball of life when they're around people they trust. So you're not that, you ain't that introverted. You're just not afraid of being embarrassed. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Anyway. It's got a little Pentecostal there. My God. All right, here we go. On to the next one. Can we say on to the next one? This is one of my favorites because this was very present in my life up until probably a few weeks ago. Um, shame makes you critical. Shame, if you find a critical person, I promise you their life is governed by shame. And the reason why I know it is because critical people believe that change is best motivated through shame. That's why when you um, ask somebody, oh, why are you criticizing me? In their heart, they're almost never going to associate it with criticism. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to see you grow. I just want you to be all that you're going to be. But the truth is, in their heart, they believe the best way to change 
is through shame. So they do to you what they do to themselves all day. Which is they beat themselves up in their mind and beat themselves up in their heart. Come on, I know it because I did it. And then I hold everybody to the standard that I'm putting on myself. Shows up as criticism. It's the reason why people can't find nothing good in anything. Shame, shame, shame. It's the way I relate to the entire world. Does that make sense? It's a big one. Okay, next one. Oh, this is so much fun to me. Okay, shame. You ready for this? Shame makes you confused. We're going to have some fun with this. One of the biblical translations of the word shame in the Old Testament literally is confusion. Which means the issue is not that you're indecisive. The issue is that you've got shame. And so you can't own up to what you know you're supposed to do. Because you're afraid of what it might cost you. And you're afraid of the way people might see you. And you're afraid of getting it wrong. Shame. Shame. You're not that confused. You just care too much what people think. And it creates a fog in your mind. I know it because I lived it. I just don't know what God's saying. I just don't know what he's saying. Yes, you do. You just scare. It's okay. It's okay. You know how long I delayed in obeying God, calling it confusion when really it was just fear of man? Okay, next one. Shame makes you act out dramatically. Either in anger, or here's a good one, self-pity. Oh, this is good. This is something I do, again, this is me. This is something I do when I'm ashamed. This actually happened earlier today. Um, it's a big one. I genuinely felt like it was a gift from the Lord. So I took an Uber to get here from my haircut. Shout out to Nick Velasquez, the man with the plan. He's doing his thing. And uh, I took my Uber and I went to retrieve my Buffalo Wild Wings as my pregame consecration meal. And I realized that I had lost my phone. Couldn't find it. No idea where it was. It was very difficult for me. But my first reaction was two things. The first thing I did was get mad. Start huffing and puffing. Oh, boy. Oh, my God. My day just going horrible. Oh. Yo, yeah. I ain't the only one who did it, okay? But the second thing I did was really funny. I started like, man, there's so much warfare over this message. Man, I'm just going through. It's just hell and high water out here. God don't want, I mean, the devil don't want me to preach this. I was just embarrassed. I created systems of self-pity to cover up the fact I was ashamed. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the next one, this is the last one, okay? So I promise you we're going we to move forward. This is one of my favorites, okay? Shame makes you stubborn specifically in repentance. Shame actually makes it harder to repent than anything else, which is the reason why religion kills people. Second Corinthians says godly sorrow leads to repentance, but worldly sorrow, a.k.a. shame, leads to death. What is the death the wages of? Which means that godly sorrow produces more sin. It makes it hard to repent because shame is counterfeit conviction. Oh, yes. Shame is counterfeit conviction. It will try to mask itself like it's conviction, but it don't produce none of the fruits of the spirit because it focuses more on you than the thing. Okay. Does that make sense? I'll give you an example right here, okay? All these things compile together in what I like to call the hiding life. Can everybody say the hiding life? This is the place where shame brings you. It's the place called the hiding life. And Adam and Eve particularly show this. And so I'm going to show you really, really quickly what the Lord had me to say, okay? So Adam and Eve, Genesis 2, Genesis 3. Fall of man, apple, pear, grapefruit, I don't know. But all I know is the serpent gave it to him. Eve ate. Adam ate, then God showed up. Now, there are many things that God could have asked in that moment, but what is the thing that he asked? He didn't ask, why are you so dumb? He didn't, I'm serious, because these are the things we think God's saying about us when we mess up. He didn't ask, why are you so dumb? 
He didn't say, didn't I tell you? He said, where are you? The hiding life. Because the thing that shame works to do is pull you out of your place. The deception that led them to sin was a deception that cost them their position. See, one of the things that you got to understand about the devil is he's always going to war against your where. He loves to war against your where, the location where you find purpose, the location you find promise. How do I know? Because he hated his own where. Isaiah says, I will ascend to the highest place. He didn't like his where. He wanted God's. So your warfare is always going to be over your where. Because the enemy couldn't accept his. The devil wants to pull you out of your place because your promise and your provision and your prosperity is connected to your place. Does that make sense? But what's powerful about this is that Adam and Eve were seemingly in the place of promise. It's not like when they sinned, they got kicked out. They still were roaming. Which means you can be in your destiny and be out of your place. You can be in your fulfillment and be out of your place. Some of us use our purpose to stand out of our place. How do I know? The Bible says that the thing that Adam and Eve used to hide themselves was what? Fig leaves. Anybody ever read Revelation 21 and 22? There's a description of something called the tree of life. And it says there's something on it called leaves. Now, what do those leaves do? Heal. So if my biblical integrity and poetic symbolism is correct, then Adam and Eve used what was supposed to heal them to hide them. Adam and Eve used the shouts to hide them. They used the Instagram posts and the captions to hide. They used the worship songs to hide. They used the sermons to hide. It was supposed to be healing them. Shame will make you do it. It'll make you religious and try to pretend like you ain't got nothing going on down there because if you pretend long enough, people won't ask. All the while, you're only a fraction of in the freedom that Jesus Christ bought for you. I know it because I lived it. Shouting over my shame. Dancing over my shame. Preaching over my shame. All the while. This is Adam and Eve's story. The hiding life. So, if Eden wasn't their place, then what was? If they were in their place but out of their place, what was their place? Their place was the affirmation, love, and affection of God. What they separated themselves from through shame was complete fellowship with God. It wasn't just through their bad behavior. It was what their bad behavior taught them about themselves that caused them to separate themselves from God. I promise you these notes was here before today for those of y'all who was in the CRX, all right? The Holy Spirit is bearing witness. Um, but this is extremely, extremely important. It created a distance inside their life through the power of shame. And it created a psychology that taught them wrong things about themselves. Does that make sense? Because there was fear. But what was the fear associated with? Y'all remember if you was in class. Why was Adam afraid? Because he was naked. You can read the scripture. It says it. He wasn't afraid because he sinned. He was afraid because he was naked. This was in my notes, I promise you. But the thing that shame does is it keeps you from hating your sin and teaches you to hate yourself. Why is it that every time you struggle with pornography, you never say, man, I hate lust. I hate sexual sin. You always say, I hate my. Oh, we're going for it. You can stay in your chairs if you want to. Every time you struggle with gossip, you say, I hate myself. I never say I hate deception. I hate confusion. Because shame that teaches you to stop looking at the sin. It teaches you to look at yourself. Wow. 
That's why we stay in it so long. Because there's no hatred for the sin. You believe that you're overcome by it. And you can't get free. So you get mad at yourself for wanting it. And you get mad at yourself for having a taste for it. Shame. 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 I lived it. It's the reason why I can say it. There's a generation of people who are trying to play hide and seek with the Lord of hosts. That's what the shame game is. It's a game called hide and seek. You're trying to dodge behind trees and you're trying to dodge behind obedience and you're trying to dodge behind Instagram captions all the while standing out of the place you were born for. This is the presence of God. Born for fellowship, born for communion, born for right standing, born for face-to-face intimacy. Shame game. Hide and seek. This is really, really big. Because when you grew up, I want to give you some keys for victory. When you grew up and you played hide and seek, the objective of the game was to stay hidden as long as possible. You were taught that you'd win if you stayed hidden as long as possible. The person who could stay in the treasure chest long enough, the person who could stay in the forest long enough was the one that won. But I want to tell you in the kingdom of God, everything is upside down. So if you want to win at the same game, I got the key for you. If you want to win at the same game, You've got to forfeit and walk out into the light of day. Allow yourself to be seen. Allow yourself to be known. Now, the problem with this is you believe that being known is losing. But the only reason why you're afraid of the seeker is because you don't know the heart of the one who's seeking you. You think you've got to hide from him. Sin told you you had to hide from him. Shame told you you had to hide from him. If I knew the heart of the seeker, I would have forfeited the game a long time ago. If I knew the heart of the seeker, I would have let them see me. If I knew the heart of the seeker, I wouldn't have been afraid. I need somebody to know that secrecy is not success. I know the American culture wants to teach you that secrecy is success. The secrecy is not success. Many of us believe that winning is keeping up the charade as long as possible. But some people are getting so exhausted, they don't know what to do with themselves. And that's why they can't sleep at night. And that's why they've got to put two extra hours putting makeup on in the morning to cover up those bags over their eyes. It's why you've got to do it because you've been trying to keep up this facade for too long trying to win the shame game hide and seek so what's the solution because these are cultures of life it's not just isolated decisions these are cultures of life the opposite of the shame game is a life of walking in the light this is one of my favorite concepts and it's the concept that truly delivered me I'm going to be as quick as I possibly can walking in the light 1 John 5 or 1 5 through 7 some of my favorite scriptures in the entire world. I'm just going to read, I believe, um, yeah, I'll read the whole thing. This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, when you read darkness, you thought it was talking about sin. But First John also says, if you say you've got no sin, you deceive yourself, which means that darkness is not sin, it's hiding. If you say you know him, but you walk in darkness, you lie. Because if you knew him, you wouldn't want to hide. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The only way to real freedom is a life in the light. I'm going to prove it really quickly to you. Through a story of a woman in John 8. The Bible calls her a woman caught in the act of adultery. Now, this does not just say that she was caught out, that she was cheating. It says she was caught in the act. So if I I like to write, and so setting and seeing matters. 
If she was caught in the act, chances are she was unrobed. What's another way of saying unrobed? Naked. Doesn't that sound familiar? I heard that word somewhere. But in John 8, nakedness was a tool of shame. That's why they caught her in the act. Does that make sense? So I want you to picture. I don't know what situation she was in. I don't know what motivated her decision. I don't know what place of desperation she got into her life while she decided to do this. But she finds herself here, and the Pharisees capitalize on it to make a point. That's one thing that religion will do is it'll use the real pain of people to try to make points. Okay, anyway, that's not my sermon for tonight. But the Pharisees pull this woman out, not just in the streets, because that's how they depict it in the movies. The Bible says it was in the temple. So they interrupted the Monday night and brought a woman in the greatest state of shame and brokenness and plopped her on the altar, took the microphone like Kanye and said, I appreciate your message, Jonathan. I'm going to let you finish, but... Religion loves to catch people. I said religion loves to catch people. But the Bible says love. Now we're going to get into it tonight. Because you thought that covering meant hiding. Wow. But if covering meant hiding, then God would have never let the woman outside in the first place. We're going to get into it tonight. All right. Here we go. The Pharisees bring up the law of Moses and do something called accusation. This is important. The word accusation means like kind of it's one of the chief means that you use to place shame on someone. You put blame on it. And the, and the Greek word literally uh, means a name for the devil. It's one of the biggest descriptions, which means that when you jump into accusation, you jump into the devil's ministry, no matter how right you think you are. Anyway, um, here we go. But accusation at its heart, another definition for it is reason. Which means that the, the, the ministry or the demonic ministry, I should say, of accusation is to find a reason to justify the feeling of unworthiness. This is why you don't deserve love. This is why you don't deserve acceptance. This is why you don't deserve affection. This is why you don't deserve a relationship. This is why you don't deserve a healthy marriage. This is why you don't deserve a ministry. This is why you don't deserve freedom. Accusation. 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 The law says she should be stoned. Accusation. Ministry of the enemy, okay? Now, the next scripture says that they said this testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. Which means every accusation, whether it's induced by self or others, is actually an accusation against Jesus. Every time the enemy tries to accuse you, whether through the voice of someone else or the voice of yourself, it's actually an accusation against the goodness and the kindness and the mercy and the favor of God. How I know this is because oftentimes, maybe y'all not like me, but I like to ask critical questions of the text. And I said to myself, if God was so loving and he wanted to cover her, why did he let her be seen this way? He could have stopped this. He could have redirected the situation because love covers, right? Gave you the hand. But this is big. And if y'all shout in church, you're going to shout with me on this. Because God used the attempt of the Pharisees to expose her to set her free. Oh, I'm creeping down the road tonight. Because if she had never got caught, she'd still be in the story. If she had never got caught, she'd still be in the sin. How many people in this room, it's easy to shout over money. It's easy to shout over favor. It's easy to shout over miracles. But how many people can shout because they got caught? I said, how many people can shout because you got caught? Because if nobody had found me out, I'd still be in the mess I was in. Yeah, they were trying to shame me. Yeah, they were trying to embarrass me. But the love of God. And I'm too focused on my freedom to worry about your motivation. I'm just glad I get to live in the light. You know how free you really are by how you respond to accusation. Free people don't, don't squimmer and, and, and get upset when people accuse you. When you say stuff about what I did in my past, you know what I'm going to say? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. 
you can tell him, yes, I did, and I'm still here. Because if God was going to give up on me, he would have given up on me by now. If God was going to let me go, he would have let me go by now. But I'm here, not because of my goodness, not because of my power, but it's because of the grace of God. I'm glad I got caught. I'm glad. I said, I'm glad I got caught. I ain't gonna sit here feeling sorry for myself because they talking about me and their text message changed. I ain't gonna sit here feeling sorry for myself because somebody tried to make an exposed video about me. I'm glad I got caught. Their motivation don't mean nothing to me. I just want to be free. So Jesus, in typical Jesus fashion, finds a way out of every trap that the Pharisees try to set for him. And he goes into the, the ground now. I don't know exactly how he was writing. I don't know what he was writing. I always picture that he was like drawing some big picture or something like that. I feel like it had nothing. It wasn't deep. I feel like Jesus was trying to illustrate how little he cared about what they had to say. But that might just be me. It might just be the pettiness in me. Um, he stands up and says what? He who is without sin cast the first stone. Really powerful. And usually the preacher would jump and shout on that. But tonight ain't about them. Because we've spent so much time talking about them and talking about how they handle us. But the issue starts here. He moves the people out of the room so he can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the woman. And he says what? Where are your accusers? When they had to stand up under the law they were trying to put on you, none of them could stand. So all of them are gone. Do any of them condemn you? No. Well, neither do I. Which is the first important thing about getting free from shame. Is realizing there's one person who has a right to condemn you. There is one person, if anybody, who has a right to say you're too dirty. To say that you're too broken. To say that he don't want to waste his time. But his sentence to her is his sentence to us. Neither do I. Neither do I. Neither do I. And I'm the only one in this room who's got the right to. But neither do I. But then he says this. He says, go and sin no more. Which means he literally commissioned her into purity. Purity is a commission. Oh, you missed it. Purity is an assignment from God. It's not just an obligation. It's an assignment. And every assignment's got an anointing. You've been trying to do it in your strength. But I promise you there's a place called grace. That's why he had to send her. He said, go. Matthew 28. It wasn't just about you preaching the gospel. It was about you living a life that was Christ-like, walking worthy of the calling. But that is not something you earn so that you can get to the commission. He sends you into your sanctification. He sends you into your purity. I promise we're almost done. Then Jesus says this, and this is where it gets crazy. Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. I never saw this before in my study. After this entire engagement, Jesus identifies himself because in biblical integrity, stories carry revelations of Jesus, which is why at the end of Abraham and Isaac's story, it ends with the name Jaira because the story was revealing Jesus, the provider. This exposed woman revealed Jesus as the light. The story ain't the light. The public opinion ain't the light. Jesus is the light. So the place you're supposed to be walking in is him. The place you were born for is him. And as it pertains to shame, there are practical ways to live that out. But what you've got to know is that your safety is not just in people knowing your story or not. Your safety is in knowing him. Jesus' kindness was that he let her be exposed. Because if she hadn't been exposed, she would have stayed in the sin. She would have never got her deliverance if she stayed in the dark. And so he said, if this is the means where it's got to happen, 
I care more about her than I care about her feelings. So I'm willing to put her in an uncomfortable position and redeem her in the middle of it. Instead of keeping her from the circumstance, I redeem her inside of it so she'll know me in a way that cannot be taken from her. And her life becomes an emblem of the goodness of God. This is what happens when you walk in the light. So these are some practical ways to do it, okay? This is how we're closing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The first step to walking in the light, okay, we talked about this a little bit earlier today, is accepting forgiveness and cl the cleansing power of the cross, okay? The only way you can truly live in the light, you're going to live, live a life outside of the dark, live a life not hiding, is you've got to believe that the cross actually worked. Because the only way I can admit what I've done and the things that, I, that happened to me is because I believe they have no power over me. Even if they happened yesterday. Understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying you don't walk through processes of sanctification. But either the Bible is true or it's not. And when the Bible says you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. And what? Cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Which means that you could possibly be more pure than you were when you sinned. Because he didn't just cleanse you of the, righteousness, the unrighteousness you committed. He cleansed you of all of it. Everything. And put you in right standing like Jesus. Does that make sense? And from that confidence, I can admit what's going on. Because I'm not going to be punished. I might be disciplined. I might be reprimanded. I might be brought into a pruning process to develop my character. But I'm not going to be punished. And I don't have to be afraid of the accusation. I don't have to be afraid of the proof that I'm not worthy. His blood proves that I am. And the issue is that people get offended when I say you're worthy because they think worthy and deserving are the same thing. But worthy, the root of worthy is worth. How many people, can anybody tell me how much a new Corvette costs? Anybody? Anybody just put out a guess? How, 60 grand? 80 grand. Okay, let's go with 80 grand. Now, tell me this. Did that car do anything for you to deserve you're missing it. Did the Corvette clean your house? Did the Corvette pay for your school? No, because it don't have to deserve it to be worth it. The worth is determined by the maker and the buyer, baby. And in your life, they're the same one. The one who made you is the one who bought you. So he's the only one who gets to tell you what you're worth. And according to him. I said according to him. I said according to him. You were worth everything. It ain't because I deserve it. In fact, that's the mystery. In fact, that's the wonder. I do not deserve it, but somehow I'm worth it because his eyes are more pure than mine. Does that make sense? Okay. That consists of this, coming out of self-consciousness. We talked about this. You can only live in that revelation to the degree you see him, which means your gospel has to stop being man-centered. It has to be God-centered because it's the awe of the love of Jesus, not the gravity of your sin. Your sin only adds context to the gravity of his love. Does that make sense? Okay, continuing on. The next one is confession and intercession. This is big. How many have heard this the term, confess your faults to one another so that you may be healed? Except that ain't what the scripture says. James 5 says, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The problem is you've been doing a lot of confession and ain't been doing no intercession. So you've been playing tattletale your entire Christian life and wondering why there's no power. Because you didn't invite the Holy Spirit to give you the grace to make the change. So what you've got to do is stop telling your story to people who ain't committed. You're frustrated because you're like, I thought I would told them and it would break off my life. But they didn't do nothing in prayer. They didn't say nothing. They didn't agree with the power of God. They didn't break and renounce the, the lies off of your life. It was a religious duty because we believed it was a math equation. Confess my faults equals be healed. No, it's the power of the ministry of the great high priest acting through his body that restores everything that was broken. And now you have a clear path to walk into the future. 
confess your faults and pray. So next time when your friend tells you I'm struggling with pornography, don't you be like, oh, man, that's crazy. <laughs> Dang, bro, that's, whoa, like, that's crazy. All right, well, see you. Can't do that. But that also means you've got to tell somebody who can. Which means somebody who's living in the understanding that they're free from the thing. So you can't confess to your cellmate and expect freedom. Oh, it's getting hot in here. You've got to talk to somebody. I didn't say somebody who's been living free for 10 years, but someone who's grounded in the revelation. Because from there, they'll exercise their authority in intercession. If you go to the wrong person, they're going to be praying for themselves. You're going to hear it in the prayer. It's going to start out about you, but they're going to be like, God, just deliver us, God. Us. 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 What's supposed to be no Us. Man, God, this flesh is crazy, God. It's hard to serve you, God. I appreciate that. <laughs> Listen, man, if it ain't real, it ain't right, okay? I spent years confessing to people who just had a shorter sentence than me. They weren't out the cell. They just had a shorter sentence. I'm sorry. Anyway. The last one. I know this is a lot, but this is life in the light, baby. Because you need restoration. And that restoration doesn't, it's not about religion. Oh, you can't, like we're, like, we're supposed to be perfect. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying someone who's grounded in the revelation that they've been made free. And part of the fruit of that revelation is a consecrated life. Does that make sense? It's not about religion. It's from, not for, okay? Last one is, this is my favorite. Break agreement with self-shaming and replace it with a commitment to radical self-encouragement. This is big because it's easy to go into the prayer circle and say, i just been struggling and everybody surrounds you and all the prophetic people got words about your dreams and your, and your people and your babies and everything like that. And you feel real encouraged. But when you can't get, should I save it? Y'all know I love you, right? When you can't get attention from the cycle and you can't get in the prayer line again because you've got to encourage yourself. Because outside affirmation can be an addiction and it can pretend like you're actually free. But you're just in an environment where people are very vocal. But when you're like David and you're in a cave, then you ain't got nobody encouraging you because everybody you sacrificed your life for done stabbed you in your back. Are you going back to your sin or are you going to encourage yourself? The only way you can do it is if you're grounded. In the revelation, what that showed up like in my life was when I struggled with lust and when stuff started creeping up on me. And I, even times when I messed up, I had to stop sitting there moping. I had to say, Lord Jesus, I confess this to you. I confess this to my accountability. We get this clear. I accept whatever circumstances of discipline you want to take me into. But I confess that I am the righteousness of God. I am not my sin. I am not my story. I am not my struggle. And this does not define me. I am more than what I have done. I am more than what I struggle with. And I had to get to the place where I didn't need nobody to do it. If everybody said, oh, Jonathan, just another one of them worship leaders. Jonathan, just another... This is before circuit riders, so just let's be clear. This is years ago, guys. This is years ago. This is for the cameras. Years ago. Before I was saved for real. Okay? Before my confession. Just want to make this clear. Okay? Because you know. You know how they do. Okay, anyway. This is for the sound bites. Anyway. <laughs> I'm serious, though. This is big, because people in church, in ministry... In positions of leadership, and they're struggling. And it starts as thoughts, it starts as ways of thinking, and because they feel like they can't admit it, it grows. Because the Bible says when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And then it produces death. But if shame's out of the conversation, somebody can say, man, my mind's going a little crazy right now. I need some help before it goes to a place it's not supposed to go. 
Now, for clarity, I grew up in church. So a lot of my story was I was doing ministry before I was saved. Okay? So just for you to be aware of that so that you don't misconstrue what I just said. Okay? Anyways. Because <laughs> listen, okay? All right. You've got to develop a culture in your life. And yes, there were times after I got saved, I didn't wake up when I got saved and whoosh. It's been a process. It's still a process. But I have to live in the place where I'm not engaging in condemnation. I'm not engaging shame in the conversation. When I mess up in any way, I can mess up in gossip. I can mess up in thinking the wrong thing about my neighbor. But I don't indulge shame as a motivator for change. I say I'm the righteousness of God. I say I've been perfected by his son and redeemed by his blood. And it's actually not because of what I did. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, just for clarity to wrap this thing up, I said I was going to give you a little bit more of my testimony. The reason why this message means so much to me is because in my sophomore year of college, what I'm referencing is a season of my life where I was struggling very deeply. I got saved about halfway through my freshman year. And in that time, I literally got kind of thrown into ministry because I had history, I had knowledge, and I loved Jesus genuinely. But there were some areas of my life, my foundations, that were not set up correctly. I still had unresolved trauma because of all different kinds of abuse, including the sexual abuse. And how that translated was dysfunctional relationships and some of them in the context of lust and sexual sin. This is very real. I'm telling you all my real story so y'all can know why when I sing Let the Redeemed of the Lord Say So, I run around here like a wild man. It's because I'm actually redeemed. And I don't have to pretend like I am anymore. Okay. Anyway. That's fine. Maybe it's just for me. Anyway, I struggled so deeply. It was not just about sexual sin, though. I struggled in people pleasing. I struggled in fear of man. I struggled with, with, with how to relate to my, my struggles and the people around me, friendships, the whole nine. I was a person who was anointed and full of bondage. Was, had grace on my life and was full of bondage. But I had to walk through a season where my stuff got outed. And thank the Lord that I had the strength to confess what I was struggling with and I had a safe enough place where leaders walked with me and helped me to figure out what was going on because I was introduced early. I didn't know all of what was there. I, I was a very difficult season. There was stuff that I didn't even know was going on inside of me. And for whatever reason, that was my story. But the truth of the matter is that season exposed that shame was a major motivator. Shame was a major system of belief and construction of the way I behaved. I performed because I was trying to prove that I was worthy. I lived according to this relationship in my life. Shame was the greatest system of thought in my entire world. And it got so bad that I literally consistently co considered suicide. Like consistently considered it. There was a season in my life where I slept under my bed in my dorm room and wept all night not even because of stuff that I had done, but things that were coming up from the difficulty that I was going through and all the shame. See, this is why this, and this is why that, and this is why this, and this is why that, because it didn't just start with me. It started in my family. My parents got divorced. They had infidelity issues. There was problems in their marriage. There was issues with almost every man in my family living in purity. And so I'm living in the narrative of a generational curse. I'm living in, uh, in trauma that affected me, and I didn't choose. Does that make sense? But shame is navigating the conversation. Shame, 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 shame. And you know what shame did? It didn't make me run to my pastors. It didn't make me run to my disciples. It made me run to the cycle in whatever kind of way. No matter how hard I tried to fight it, it took me a while to get out. And I got out by the power and the grace of God. But it was because of these principles of walking in the light. The first one was accepting the work of the cross. The Lord literally rebuked me. One of the last times I fell in sin in a specific way, the Lord literally rebuked me and said, stop asking for forgiveness. I said, what are you talking about? And now I'm not saying don't ask for forgiveness. Hear what I'm saying. He said, start thanking me that you're forgiven. Ask, but thank me. Because if you stay asking, there's a part of you that believes it's not there. And the freedom comes when you know that because I confessed, I'm cleansed. That was the first part. He brought me into critical relationships where I've got to be accountable. I am accountable to the circuit rider leadership. Okay? Am I accountable? Okay. 
You can look. I got a few over there. Huh? Amen? Amen. All right. We can play around if we want. But I got to live accountable. I might be anointed. I might know how to scream and shout in the Holy Ghost. But I'm being discipled. And my journey is still progressing. But shame keeps me hidden and tries to pretend that I'm perfect because I'm anointed. Shame tries to get me to, to lighten up this story so that you won't ask no questions. That's why I wondered if I should share it. I'm serious. This is what preachers do. This is what ministers do. We try to dress up our story. Because we're living in the shame game. But when God starts to break out of your life, you say, you're going to think what you're going to think about me. You're going to tell rumors if you want. You're going to make up stories if you want. That is your business. But if I'm living right before God and my leadership and my accountability, I ain't stunning you. Respectfully. I love you. But respectfully, I cannot live under worrying about what everybody in the world thinks about me. Because what is that? Shame. Okay, anyway. Like we said, accountability, walking in the light. This is big. Thank you guys. You guys are the best. Okay. But lastly, I learned to celebrate my progress. Because the truth is, before I was saved, I went through a season where I had ups and downs. But before I was saved, I was living reckless. Okay? Wreck, I said reckless. Reckless. And I'm not saying that to glorify my circumstance. I'm saying that because too often, we don't look at the work of the Holy Spirit in us. So we live like the place we are is the place we started. And we live like the starting line has moved over and over again, so we get disappointed and disgruntled, and we don't look at how far Jesus has taken us. It'll create gratitude in your heart that will motivate you to keep going. Does that make sense? This is helpful for anybody? Okay, so let me ask you this. How many people have identified in their heart something that they've struggled with shame in? It could be something that you've done. It could be something somebody did to you. It could be something that isn't even bad or, or is not good either. It's just neutral, but something that you've related to from a place of shame. Keep your hands raised. Keep your hands raised. This is what I'm going to ask. If the worship team can come back, we're going to close this. But this is what I want everyone to do. If we can, can we um, stand up, please? Shame is one of the number one issues in everybody's walk with Jesus. Everybody. It's the reason why when you sin, you think you got to take a two-day um, intermission before you can pray again. I got to feel bad enough or else I'm not repentant. Where did we get that? Godly sorrow produces repentance, which means you cannot shed one tear and actually change. How many people know somebody who just a uh, crying psycho person? You know what I'm talking about. God, I'm just so sorry. And can't get free. I'm not making fun of them. This is real because how many of us have done it? I did it. But because it was not godly sorrow, focused on self, motivated by shame, critical of self, trying to make myself improve. So this is what we're going to do. How many want to break the power of shame off their life tonight? Come on, can somebody say it again? How many people want to punch shame in the face tonight? Okay, so this is how you're going to do it. You're going to do something that you don't always do. First person you're going to deal with is the Lord. Second person you're going to deal with is your neighbor. This is going to be great. I love it already. First one, these are, I think it's like four steps. I think this is really big. The first one is with the Lord, and it's this. Accept the forgiveness of Jesus. So that's confessing your sin and receiving forgiveness. Now, everybody raised their hand saying that they knew something. So I don't want to hear no whisper prayers talking about some unspoken. I don't know what I'm talking about. Where are my young guns at? Where are my young guns at? What's up, gang? Unspoken. I haven't unspoken. Y'all remember that in church? Can you just pray for me? For what? Unspoken. You want me to pray in tongues? I'm sorry. Anyway. So I want you to confess your sins to the Lord and then 
literally receive his forgiveness. That's the first two R's of the four R's, right? We're going to go for that. You can rebuke and replace if you want, definitely. But I think there are some specific things that are important tonight specifically. That's for God. But the second part is this. I want you to make confession of the truth of who you are. So it's not just replacing saying, okay, I, if I struggle with, um, let's say, I don't know, control. I accept, um, I accept the spirit and I replace it with freedom and courage, right? You're going to make declarations about who you are. Because according to the scripture, you are not what you've done. You are what Jesus says you are. So even if you messed up before you came in this room with lust, you have a right to say you're pure if you're saved. I said you've got a right to say it because it's not your purity. Then the last one is, again, making confession to your brother. So that next one, that last one I just said specifically, it's not just before the Lord. I want you to say it to your neighbor. Hey, this is what God says I am because this is what I did. Does that make sense? So I'll guide you through it again because I know I was a little confusing there. But the last one is I want your neighbor to go to war. And I want your neighbor to step in their seat of authority. I want them to step into their office as a royal priest. And I want them to pray like they're praying for themselves. I want them to pray like they're praying for their own issue and the way they wish somebody had prayed for them. I, we're going to do some work in this building. We're going to see an exchange. So this is the first step. Ask forgiveness from Jesus and then receive his forgiveness. Okay, so can we do this? So on the count of three in your own words, whatever it is that came to your heart, you guys can just play. And I know we don't have to sing anything right now. I want us to say this literally. Just confess your sins before the Lord and literally out of your mouth say, I receive your forgiveness. Okay, can we do that? So go ahead. Just, just feel free on the count of three. One, two, three, go. Come on in your own words. You know, it's okay. It's okay. No one's judging you in here. If your neighbor can hear you, you just giving them a, a precursor to what you're about to tell them. Come on, you ain't got to be embarrassed. Part of how shame works is it tries to keep you from telling the real story because you're afraid of what people are going to think. It don't matter what they think. They don't got your deliverance. They don't have your healing. Come on, let's go. It's so free. Come on, come on, keep lifting it up. Now, if you've already confessed, I want you to begin to say, Jesus, I receive your forgiveness. I say the blood is enough for me. I say the blood has cleansed me. I'm washed. I'm clean. I am not my sin. I'm not my struggle. I'm not my story. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I've been made new. I've been made right. And I thank you. I receive it as truth that I am not what I was. I am who you say that I am. Now, real quick before we move to the next one, there's some people who might not be able to do that because they're not saved. This promise don't work unless you give your life fully to Jesus. This is big. Because the world will try to sell you the self-help version. Forgiveness is for the saved. It's for all, it's available to all, but it's received by the saved. Does that make sense? So, this is what I want to do really quickly. If you have not given your life to Jesus, if we can, do we have like a salvation connect thing or something like that? Because I want us to keep stay in the flow. Weapon. You want to, okay, so this is what I want you to do. If you've not given your life to Jesus, this is what I want you to do. Every head bow, every eye closed. If you're recognizing that you've not put your full faith in Jesus, that you're not saved because Jesus is not your Lord, you've not received forgiveness of sins, but you want to give your life fully to Jesus tonight, this is what I want us to do. With eyes closed, head bowed, under this premise where Jesus is not shaming you, he's not looking at you with angry eyes, he's looking at you with eyes of love, saying, I want you back, I want you back, I wanna be in fellowship with you, and I died to make it available. This is your promise. So while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you want to give your life to Jesus either for the first time or a rededication to him, giving your full life, can you just raise your hands all across the room? Just raise your hands. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Come on, with your eyes closed, can you make some noise for these people? Come on, keep your hands raised. Thank you, Jesus. 
Come on, God snatched some people out of the grave tonight. Can we make some more noise? Thank you, Jesus. Ho! Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So this is what I want you to do. All right. If you raise your hand, this is Squad Salvation Connect team. Oh, can you guys raise your hand? This is the Salvation Connect team. I would love for you guys to, in the next like one minute or so, just run down here and run down to this corner. I promise you, you're gonna get the greatest applause you've ever gotten in your life. Just kind of, just run down here real quick, real quick. Don't be ashamed, don't be afraid. Just run down here, run down here. Come on, make some noise for them. I promised them a big applause. Come on, there's more. I know there's more. Come on, your family's coming home. Make some noise. Family's coming home tonight. Come on, if there's more, if there's more, if there's more, if there's more, come on, tonight's your night. It's your moment. It's your moment. Come on. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. You don't have to save yourself. He did it for you. Come on. All across the room, all across the room. All right, real quick. Man, can we make one more shout for this crew? just gave their lives to Jesus. All right, so welcome to the family. You've got the Salvation Connect team. They're gonna rumble with you, give you the clarity of everything that you just signed up for, get you connected, get you in the family in a little bit more of an official way. On their way out, can we make one more round of applause for them? Come on, y'all. This is what we do. Circuit riders, baby. Riding through the night. Salvation, the harvest is right. Hey. All right, now, I apologize to those who lost their neighbor just now. But you can find a new one, okay? I hope there's an even number in here. If not, then um, somebody gonna have to talk to Jesus, like Brandon Lake said. Okay. Um, but it, can everybody find a neighbor really quickly, really quickly? Everybody got a neighbor. I would prefer if you can, guys with guys and girls with girls. I think that would be very healthy because some of y'all got some stuff to confess that ain't appropriate for that kind of relationship. Amen? All right. Come on, somebody. Listen. Listen. So if you can, guys with guys, girls with girls, this is what we're going to do. We're going to tell them what we confess to the Lord, and then we're going to replace it with a new confession of who we are. This is what I did, but because of the blood of Jesus, this is who I am. Okay? So take a minute to do that. Go ahead. Come on, don't hold back. Don't Christianize the story. Tell the real thing now. You may as well. We already out here. This is it. Come on. This is the beginning of the change right here. If you can tell the story like it really happened, it loses authority over you. Come on. Tell it. Don't be scared. They probably got one just as bad. All right, if you've done it, I want you to switch, switch. Partner, tell your version now. Tell them who you was mad with. Tell them who you slept with. Whatever it is, it's okay. Be honest. God's not scared. He saw already. Wow. All right, y'all can keep going. But real quick, we're gonna move to the next one in a second. Try to wrap them up, try to wrap them up. I wanna get your attention because we wanna move to the next thing, okay? I know y'all getting excited, this is good. All right, real quick, real quick, real quick. Everybody, look up here, look up here, look up here. Really quickly, really quickly. I know y'all in the middle of telling your story. I promise y'all can talk after, after I'm done, okay? I promise. But I want us to keep going, okay? Now, can I ask you something really quickly? Don't it feel cleaner already in here? 
because most of the stench of sin is shame and condemnation so when you break shame and condemnation you already start to feel cleaner does that make sense keep confessing keep confessing come on this is part of your gospel this is part of your testimony you ain't just saved you being saved come on you're being saved go we're gonna move forward to the next one okay you ready everybody look up stop your prayers stop your prayers stop your prayers I know we got a long list that's all right you ain't got to tell the list back but we want to move forward okay is that okay all right everybody look forward if you can I know some of y'all intercessors started bubbling up and started praying already we didn't move to that part yet just give me one second just give me one moment look up here look up here look up here okay so this is what I want you to do now that both of y'all have confessed I want you to take turns, whichever one of you wants to go first. Matter of fact, the person who confessed first, the other person pray first, okay? All right? So this is what I need to do. I need everybody's attention. So if you're praying, I need you to pause. The Holy Spirit gonna hear you if you pause, I promise. This, the channel don't stop up, okay? Now I need you to get some grit. And I need you to pray over this person like it's you. Pray like your deliverance is in this. Pray for them until the priestly ministry of Jesus becomes real. I want you to pray like the way you yell at the TV when a football game comes on. The way you, you scream when your favorite player shoots the three or dunks the basketball. I want you to pray, okay? Can we do that? So on the count of three, I want you to pray. Ready? One, two, three. Go to war. Go ahead. pray I feel the glory of the Lord filling this building pray this is the ministry of the high priest come on pray for your brother pray for your sister come on because you've got a mediator because you've got a mediator come on pray come on pray come on pray pray in faith pray with conviction pray under the assignment pray with authority come on pray come on pray come on pray Yeah, pray, pray. We break condemnation. We break the assignment of deception. We break every lying love that tells us that we're better off in criticism, that we're better off in brokenness. We break it, we break it, and we release ourselves into the joy of the Lord. Come on, right now, every ounce of shame be broken. Every ounce of deception be broken. Everything that tells you you're not good enough for God, be broken. You are a child of the living God. You are so loved that he spilled his blood for you. So right now we say every part of your destiny is still at work. You haven't forfeited it. You you haven't thrown it away. God's promise is still yes and amen. Come on, pray, pray, pray. Right now, the power of condemnation is being broken. The power of condemnation is being broken by the strong hand of God. Pray, pray, pray. Come on, pray. Come on, pray. Come on, there's authority here. There's authority here. They confess. Healing is flowing. Healing is flowing. Come on. Healing is flowing. Healing is flowing. Come on, intercessor. You don't need a microphone. You can break a stronghold with your confession. Break the stronghold of condemnation. Break the stronghold. Release them into the power of the gospel. Right now, 
in the name of Jesus, we accept the full inheritance of the mighty Son of God. And we say that because he says we're free, we're really free. Because he says we're healed, we're really healed. And our pain and our sin and our stories no longer have power over us. We enter into the joy of the Lord. We enter into the freedom for which Christ has set us free. We say no longer will we live according to the narrative of our shame. We say no longer will we live according to the lie that we are not worthy because we're undeserving. But we say right now that Jesus decided that I'm worth it. Jesus decided that I'm valuable. Jesus decided that I'm precious. Jesus decided, and because he decided, there's no more debate. Because he decided, there's no more conversation. So right now, we cut off all conversation with the enemy. We cut off all conversation with darkness. We cut off all conversation with our past life. We cut off all conversation with our flesh and the narratives thereof. And we say, according to the power of the blood, we have been washed, we've been made new, and we're free to be free. We're free to live in our purpose. We're free to live in our assignment. We're free to live in our destiny. We're free to live in communion. We're free. Come on, we're free. I said we're free. Come on, if you're wrapping up your prayers, don't you feel the power of God lifting up in this building? This is what I need you to do. We're just going to go for it. You don't need an introduction. On the count of three, I'm going to tell you to lift up a shout. And when you lift up a shout, I want you to flood this altar in joy. I want you to flood this altar in praise because you've been made free by the blood of the Lamb. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? I said, are you ready? One, two, three, let's go. Come on, shout. Come on, shout. Because you're free. Because you're free. Come on, don't wait for an introduction. Come on, flood this altar in praise. Flood this altar in worship. Flood this altar in adoration. Because you're free. Because you're free. Because you're free. Because what you did does not define you. Because what you did has no authority over you. Because if he would have left you, he would have left you by now. But you've been set free. Come on, I want you to rejoice because he loves you. I want you to rejoice because he ain't mad at you. I want you to rejoice because he's not counted your sin. The Bible says that he forgets your transgressions for his own sake and remembers them no more. So right now, can you lift up a shout like a free people in this building? Come on, lift up a shout. Lift up a shout. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say so. Say so. Say so. Say so. Come on, let's go. Let's go up. Let's go up. We're ascending the mountain of the Lord because he gave us clean hands. Because he gave us a pure heart. I didn't give it to myself. He gave it to me. I didn't give it to myself. He gave it to me. Come on, one more shout. If you're free in the building, go ahead.
harder than snow I've been redeemed Cause he's made me whole as by his blood You made a way And now I stand with you In victory And where are the chains that held me? Where are the chains that held me?
part of the night. Stamper, we give you a round of applause, bro. We honor you. That was a word. We thank you, bro. Seriously. We honor you as the men of God tonight. Seriously. Guys, we're so grateful you're here. Circuit Rider staff, listen to me very carefully. There are people in this place that need more prayer. And so, I, I'm not kidding you, this is Derek Mack speaking to you. This is not CR Monday Night, Derek. This is Derek Mack, Circuit Rider staff. I want you to head out there with Ian. I want you to meet and be ready to pray for people. If you need prayer in this room and you want to pray with a Circuit Rider staff about some of the things you uh, were talking about tonight and you want someone who has a little bit more maybe the... Uh, walking this out a little bit more, then head out there to get a little bit more prayer. We love you guys. We will see you next Monday, same time. What'd you say? What'd you say? Oh yeah, go down the runway here. Runway here if you want prayer, and we'll put you with a group. Love you guys. Have a blessed night. We will see you next Monday.